Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming out for my talk. Uh, it's fun to be at FOSDEM. This is my, it's my first time here, and I'm excited to talk about uh, this new game engine we've been working on called Redwire. Um, and it's, I think it's interesting because it's it's game engine that's we're trying to do something else. Uh, we're trying to do um, a game engine specifically made for remixing and mashing up games. So we've taken like a really different approach to game engines, a really different approach to the kind of way you can mix games together. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about what, it, what, what kind of games and mashups we're trying to make, about how we have this visual programming environment where you can, that's inspired a lot from, from um, electronics hacking and how you can kind of pull together different parts of a game and mix them together. And the kind of debugging tools and live coding tools that we can integrate into it. And some of the technical challenges involved with doing that, especially in a browser. Okay, so just a few words about where I'm from. So I'm American, but I'm living in Paris and working at this uh, place called the CRI, which is the Center for Interdis Interdisciplinary Research. And so it's a lab that's kind of at the crossroads between education, technology, and science. And there's a, they do have a bunch of different activities. One of the main activities is education. So there's some higher education programs involving all, all the way, you know, from masters all the way up to, uh, to postdoc levels and, and also education in schools. And, and, and also after school programs. And the idea, it's, the guiding principle is um, learning through research and learning through play. And so the idea is that the students, whether the, whatever level they are, come with their own ideas um, and, and are sort of inspired to learn about science and learn about engineering through kind of exploring the projects that they come up with. Okay, um, so we also have, we also, have uh, we also develop our own open source projects there. So one of the projects we develop now is called um, No Nodes, which is a distributed way to link knowledge across the internet um, and show graphs about it. This project called CoIdea, which is something to, it's a platform on the web in order to spark new creative projects among people who don't know each other and come from really different backgrounds. Uh, a project called Symbio for All, which is in synthetic biology um, and a way to create new projects in synthetic, in synthetic biology. Uh, we have some games we're working on, um, in particular, uh, Iroquois, which um, which um, Raphael is going to talk about, I think it's two more talks. Uh, so you get to learn a lot about that and synthetic biology and some other games um, around teaching optics and about studying creativity. And um, we also are working in this domain called this domain of citizen science. So if you haven't heard of citizen science before, it's basically like an approach to open science where you're trying to get both kind of um, have science that applies to people's everyday lives and then get them involved in making the science themselves, whether that's gathering data for a scientist or actually doing analysis or even coming up with their own ideas for the kind of science that they would like to do and learning about science as they're carrying out those, their own experiments. Um, there's some really famous uh, scientific games that you've probably heard of. One is called Fold It. That's probably the biggest success in the field about folding proteins. But there's many others along those. There's also these, there's a bunch of gene games also. We actually do sequencing of genes in order to help scientists out when they're, when they're trying to understand like extinction and different um, the way that you know, species are evolving. And as part of this Citizen Cyber Lab project, which is an EU project that we're working on, I came in, when I was first hired, this is the project I came in on, and my boss said that you know, we're trying to make games to allow scientists to create new citizen science games. I'm sorry, we're trying to make a platform to uh, create new citizen science games. And so you know, I was thinking about what, what kind of game engines we might be able to reuse, something like that. And, you know, so I had this conversation with my boss, and he was saying, well, we should, you know, ultimately a scientist should just be able to take parts of one game and parts of another game and kind of mix them together. And then, you know, kind of add some more stuff, like, like whatever he wants, and then in the end he has his own game that's totally new. So I was like, well, you know, it's, you know that, that's a really good idea, but it's totally impossible. Right? You can't just, I mean, I know this, you can't. I'm a programmer, I've been programming forever. You can't just take code from one thing and mix it to another thing, you know. You could eventually take a library and reuse it or something like that, but you can't just mix things. And he said, well, why? Why, why? why can't you? And that got me really thinking, like, it's true that ultimately, you know, we've been programming for a long time, right, all in all. We have lots of technologies up there. Um, you know, we have, you know, we have functions and classes and meta-classes and meta-objects and entity component systems and distributed version control and thousands of technologies and signals and slots and and millions of programming languages and billions of um, billions of game engines and even more libraries that go to those game engines, right? And yet we still can't do this fundamental thing of mixing things together. It's still not easy. And it's true that when you think about it, um, we, we all, I think, would like programming to be more like building with Legos, right? You know, you, you, you want to move your Lego thing, you just take off the top and you stick something else onto it, right? Changes the color, it doesn't matter. 
but in fact, when when you actually try to you know um, alter a system and actually try to mix parts together, that's called that's called refactoring, right? That's like this horrible microsurgery that you have to carry out. Where you have to examine every little bit of oh, hold on a second, but if I take this out, is that going to mess up that other thing? And then you do do it, and it breaks everything. And maybe you know if you're lucky, you have a good test base, and maybe you can realize exactly at least what kind of things are broken. And if you're unlucky, you don't have any tests at all, so you don't know what you're breaking, in fact. And then it just takes even longer. And it's impossible even to know how long it's going to take when you're doing it. And so this was, um, so this is the kind of thing I was thinking about, but I got a lot of inspiration uh, by this, um, by the inventor of the closure programming language, which his name is Rich, Rich Hickey. He has a bunch of excellent talks that you really should, if you're interested in this topic, you really should check them out. It's fantastic. And one of them is called Simple Made Easy, where he basically goes through and he observes uh, in much greater detail than I'm doing now, about what, what things actually prevent you from uh, separating out parts of a system. And he defines this thing called simplicity. And simplicity is an objective measure, it's an absolute measure, where you can say, well, it's about how things interleave. He gives the um, uh, comparison of kind of braiding uh, threads together. As long as threads are straight and parallel, they don't touch directly. You can easily take one out, you can move it around, you're not going to mess anything up. But as soon as threads are all braided up together in some kind of knot, well then obviously pulling on one, you don't know what's going to happen. And in fact, ultimately that's the problem. It's not so much that it might take you a while, it's that you don't even actually really understand the, uh, the consequences. When you start building onto a system as you go on, as you go on, at some point, right, I mean, probably a lot of you have had this experience, suddenly new behavior starts emerging out of your system that you don't understand. You know, suddenly it just starts doing weird things, stuff that worked before doesn't work anymore. And it's not that you took anything out, it's just that you added new things. And, and ultimately, why is, I and mean, that's actually really cool for games. I mean, we're actually looking for emergence in games, right? We want simple games that you put components together and new things come out. But for programming, it's horrible because, in fact, we, we have bugs and we can't fix them. And um, so, so some of the lessons he came up with, um, one of the ones I'm, I'm really pulling from, is first of all, basically trying to avoid this tangling, try to keep things independent and separate. And the other thing is to leave data alone. So often we kind of wrap data between behind interfaces where you have to call a bunch of methods or functions in order to access the data and modify it. And that also is a barrier to putting things together because you need a new API if you want to use a different system. Um, and and, and a, a, basically a saner abstractions around time and memory. Basically the idea that in a lot of systems, memory might just change as you're working on it. You know, you're in a function call and you're doing something and maybe it's multi-threaded and another thread comes in and changes what your memory you're working on right now. Or maybe it's an asynchronous event, like in JavaScript there's a lot of callbacks. Maybe a callback comes in and changes something while you're working on it. And, and you, can't, you can't really plan that out. It's really hard. It's really hard to debug those problems. So um, another source of inspiration is thinking about how this is done in electronics. Because think of, Legos are actually a little too simplistic, right? A little too basic to actually base something on. Because, you know, the interface, okay, these little, these little plastic uh, knobs and stuff. But there's no, there's no movement. There's no communication going on. Whereas electronics, if you take the example of a breadboard, right, where you have, you know, rows and rows of pins that are all electrically connected, you can just come and stick a resistor in there, stick a capacitor in there, and they're going to automatically connect, right? Like the interface is just that there's a wire. That's all there is. And, the, and it has a bunch of advantages. One is that you can connect anything, so you can just, you know, put, put a new resistor in without changing anything else. You can measure anything anywhere. You can, you know, take a multimeter or take a... Um, oscilloscope and stick it in maybe several places at once and, and, and observe how the system's going on. Which also means you can test it, right? Like you can just, you can test a sub part of the circuit because you just pull out all the other connections and you can understand exactly what's going on within that part. And you can replace everything. You can take out one thing and stick something else in there. Again, you don't have this problem with the interface, you don't have this problem with recompiling, it's not going to know what the library is, kind of thing. It just doesn't exist. And so try to think about how that might work. Now there's this thing called visual programming. So I don't know who's used visual programming languages. There's quite a few of them. It's kind of an old idea. It comes from like the early days of computing. There was this idea that well, you could represent uh, nodes. You could represent mathematical operations as nodes in a graph. And on the top of a graph, you'd have these two. You'd have you know multiple one or more um, links coming in, and that's data that flows into that node. And once it reaches the node, well then it produces some does something. It produces an output. And that flows to the next one down the graph that might take input from other places and so on. And in fact, it's interesting because this actually was not developed as a, a, um, as a visual programming language. It was actually originally developed as kind of a, an alternative architecture against like the von Neumann architecture that eventually dominated, at least all the way up until uh, 
graphics cards, you know, that nowadays can do things in parallel. The idea was that you could do tons of computation in parallel. And eventually, that, you know, they kind of lost that argument. But in the end, um, it kind of resurfaced as a visual programming idea. The idea, well, you can just take, you take blocks and they, you know, do actions and they produce data and you stick them together like that. So it's, you know, it's very similar to what we're talking about. And there's actually quite a few visual programming languages. Like, uh, this is one called Flowhub that's fairly recent, but there's a huge number um, also in scientific computing. And in fact, they already are integrated into a lot of game engines. But the problem is, as you start, these graphs look really simple. They're really easy to understand when it's just a few nodes. But the problem is, when you start adding on to it, you get something like this, right? So this is kind of cool. This is an Unreal. You can actually program a level all using the visual programming language. But like, no one else can understand it, right? I mean, this is totally crazy. And, and, and ultimately, it's spaghetti code all over again. It's just visual this time. So you just realize how crazy it is. But it doesn't help you really understand it. So we had this. So we tried to think about how we can change that. How can, how can we make put some order into this visual craziness? And we had the idea of separating out. Basically, the basic idea is taking the memory out of the blocks. So currently, in most systems, you know, each of those blocks might have its own memory, and things, something that might change at any particular time. And what, the idea is to take all that out and centralize it into one big memory component. So this memory has a bunch of slots. So this, these are data slots. They can have whatever, whatever kind of data you want in them. And they have pins going in and pins going out. So as you might suspect, you can take, here I'm calling them chips, something that is going to produce a value, going to do a calculation or something like that. It's basically a function. And it also has input pins and it has output pins. And so you just connect them up. So you take out from the memory and hook into the chip. And then you can do it a second time. You can have it go back again. So here we can say that at the, uh, the result of when this chip does its calculation, it's going to feed back into the memory. And you can have it feed back into multiple places and through a different place. There's no real restriction about it. Um, we can set up a second chip and have it run in parallel to the first. So we can reuse that data again and again have it flow back somewhere. So I'm just going to take you through how this, is, how this will be executed Okay, if you had this kind of setup. So the first thing you do Oh, right, sorry, one more th detail. Um, we can put in also constant values into the chips. If, like, you know, if you don't want to store everything in memory, some things you don't need to. Um, so the first thing you do that the game engine is going to do, right, so we're, we're on a, it's a game engine, so it's on a clock. Right? So we're on, say, like a 60 hertz clock. So at every frame, hup, we're going to basically freeze the memory at that point. We don't want the memory to move during the clock frame. Right? So we're going to freeze it, and we're going we're gonna to calculate what the chips are going to get is input. So it's like the chips are pulling in from, that, from their pins, right? What's going to happen? And then what's going to happen is all those pins are going to do their calculation in parallel. So they're isolated. They're not directly connected to each other. So if you, you can take one out and put a different one in, it's not going to change what the first one does. This one at this point is totally independent from that. The only thing they have in common is they're both getting their source data, their input data from the same place. But beyond that, they don't have any other interaction. And then once they've calculated their values, well then, you, kinda, you take that data back, whoop, and you flow it back into the memory. And so memory is now going to be basically reset with new information. And again, all at once. So it's not a thing where like one chip is going to write something, and then the other chip comes in real quick and writes right over it, so you never saw the first one. What this is, even if they connect to the same pin, it could detect, if they wrote different values to the same pin, it could detect a conflict. And it would say, stop, 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 you have a problem in your code. Right, which is nice already. And in fact, in some cases, you can even merge the two together. Like imagine the data you're writing is an array, and both chips add things to the array. Well, then it can just make a new array with more stuff in it. It can merge them in together in certain cases. Obviously, if one writes one and the other one writes zero, you know, there's a problem, and it's better to stop at that point. But you can handle merges in other cases. Um, oh yeah, please ask me questions also, by the way, uh, as, as we go, if you have any, if you have any questions. So I can, yes? Uh, you can't. Well, you, the thing is, you can't directly connect this and this. In fact. That's that sort of thing. So they're they're linked only through the fact that they have a common memory base that they're pulling from, and that prevents this kind of. Because in most visual programming languages, indeed, you hook them up in series. So you have this chip feeds into that chip, feeds into that chip. Yes, you can do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you definitely. But you have to pass through memory each time, which seems like 
it's kind of annoying. You're like, at first it seems like, well, that's a, that's a silly barrier. Why not just hook them up directly? But what's nice about it is, once again, independence. You can, you can take one out, and the first one's still reading from memory. It's not going to fail because it doesn't have any input anymore. Yeah? But doesn't this limit your performance to your slow chip? Well, the idea is they're running in parallel. So yes, if you have chips that did some crazy computation, then it's not a very good way to do it. You'd have to break up the, either break up the computation over several cycles or kind of ship that out to something else that's going to do a long computation and come back with the result. So the idea is that chips only do things that you can calculate quickly within a cycle. 60 hertz. Yeah, within 60 hertz, yeah. So it has to be pretty fast. Did I see another question? Yes? Uh, and so uh, in this case, we, we have to assume that uh, uh, each uh, computation takes uh, one, step, one step, right? Yeah. So right. if you want to do more than one computation, like a, a evolution of, for your game or something, mm -hmm. okay, within the, the same time frame, you, you, cannot, you, you can only do it like uh, 60 times a second. Yeah, so it's going to be called 60 times a second. Afterwards, you can, like, so like I was saying before, you can either, if you have something, computation is going to take too long, then, uh, I guess I, I'm wondering, is your question that it's taking too long? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, for example, in, you, you have a game and you have uh, AI, and then uh, after the, uh, the AI, you want to have the player do something or provide or something. Oh, okay. So, so things that don't happen in parallel. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, yeah, All right, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to that a little later. I'll explain okay. how we're going to do that. Yes? Hi. Um, have you actually um, studied state machine theory and electronic engineering? Because you pretty much just described the, the theory of the Moore state machine oh, from okay. 1963, which okay. is exactly this, that you basically only produce outputs from memory. You centralize the memory, and mm -hmm. then you have a feedback loop with a clock. Um, state machine in order to make sure that your your logic functions provide the feedback input oh, before cool. the next clock cycle. It sounds very, very similar, in fact. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll definitely check that out. state machine theory, especially okay. more state More machine statements theory. It looks, I think you'll probably find a lot of answers to oh, the great. issues you're having. Thank you. I've seen these kind of things before in electronic mm -hmm. engineering where you see um, simulation packages mm -hmm. for chip design. Yeah, we're oh. simulating more state machines, so code probably already exists. So they're, it's, 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 they're, they're testing the way to build those, yeah, those chips? Yeah, I did, did low-level design and basically oh, okay. simulators for Isn't testing oh, okay. and, and maybe Maybe we'll, I'd get to talk to you afterwards. I'd like to ask you some more questions about that. Any more questions, or should I keep going? All right, I'll keep going. So, Okay, so this, this would explain basically just writing out to memory. But for a game, that's obviously not enough, right? I mean, memory doesn't do anything. You're not showing anything on the screen. You're not getting any input from the player. It's pretty limiting. So how can you do uh, input and output? And so what's interesting is that we came up with the idea of just having input and output be another kind of memory. A lot like a buffer. A lot like in the old days, I think people used to write out to the screen. You just put a bunch of data somewhere in the, in the buffer for the screen. And then when the screen came around to actually draw it, it would read it all up and, and draw whatever was written there at that particular time. And so, for example, in, you might have pins for the mouse, pins for the keyboard, kin, pins for graphics. Right? Obviously, it's a little more detailed than that, but just, for the, just to give you an example. Um, so how, how does that work? So we can, have a, we can have a chip, just as we did before. We can hook things up the same way we did before. Basically, we can uh, tie the, input out, in, the output from the mouse. Obviously, there's no input here, right? Because you can't control the user's mouse from them. Um, and you can send data back again to some of them, for example, writing graphics. So maybe this chip is drawing graphics on the screen based on the position of the mouse, for example. And you can mix the two. You can have memory involved in there, too. So you can have a chip getting data both from the input from the user and also the memory and writing back to both. It can write back to the memory as well. And so just to take you through the same cycle, the first thing that happens when the, when the, the clock cycle falls, we calculate whatever the chip is, so we both, now we're freezing memory in some sense, and we're freezing also the input of the system, right? We're going to say for this entire clock cycle, we're going to imagine that the mouse is at this constant value, so the whole system agrees. We're going to calculate whatever needs to be put into the chip. The chip's going to do its thing, and write out both to memory and to I.O. at the same time. So I'll just give a little example, a little more practical example. Obviously, it's a little bit of a baby example, but otherwise it's hard to fit things on a slide. So I'm going to do it this way. So imagine we want to both move. So this is a psych, this is um, a drawing that's going to both uh, a diagram that's going to move something on the screen and draw it at the same time. So the first chip. So in memory we have a speed and a position. Okay. We can see that this is sent to a move chip so that at every cycle the uh, the move chip is going to modify the position and send it back again. And separately in parallel we have a draw chip that's going to draw something at a particular position 
and output that shape that we want to draw. And so when these things run, every time you're going to have the thing move across the screen. And it's done in a parallel well. So, so, so once again, the, the advantages of this is that I can take one out. I can take out the draw thing, and it's not going to affect the movement. I can take out the movement, and it's not going to affect the draw. And I can also just change directly these values. If I don't want it to draw from memory, I can just give it a different value at where I want it to draw. They're totally independent from each other. And to go back to the electronics example, we can also measure everywhere. Right, so we know what the value of memory is at this point because it was frozen. So we can easily go back in time and say, okay, well, hold on. There was a, imagine, you know, the thing jumps on the screen and you don't know what's going on. You want to try to understand what the problem is. You could go back to that frame that's not working and you can say, well, what, what was the memory at this point? You can look at it. What was the output at that point at each part of the graph? And you can easily go through there and find your bug. Okay, so... Um, so we've, we've de designed a few different kind of basic types of chips. So there's, these, there's a chip called an emitter chip that basically just calculates values and sends it out. Um, there's a processor chip that has multiple inputs and multiple outputs to do a little more sophisticated things. So it might pull from several places and modify them all at the same time. We have splitters, which take a long uh, calculation over a large, a large set of data. It's a little bit like a map reduce <coughs> type of operation, or a mapping operation. So if you have a, a large number, for example, of game objects you want to do the same thing for on the screen, well then you would, you'd, you'd have your big list and you'd throw it to a splitter and it would call, it would, it would do the same calculation for each one. And finally we have this switch, which is going to get to the question that was asked earlier about how we kind of sequence things together. So I'm going to give an example. So, uh, so, so, so far what I've shown you, only you have all these chips that are always running in parallel all the time. So it's not obvious how you sequence your game, right? Obviously, you don't, the game has some kind of, you know, uh, movement to it. Maybe it starts with the intro screen and then it plays some music and then it is a selection thing, and then you're playing the game, and then if they pause, you want it to stop, et cetera, or then they die. So the way you do that is you use this notion of a switch. And so the switch is a chip, just like the other one, so it has input and it has output. But in addition, it also has connections to have children. And what it does to those children, other chips, is that it turns them on and off at every cycle. So at every, what's going to happen now is that at every cycle, um, when we first start, the switches are going to go through and calculate based on memory, or based on the user input from the user, which of their child chips should be activated. And it's going to turn one on. For, ex for example, imagine it decides to turn this one on and the second two off. Maybe it's just going to do a little sequence, turn one after the other. Now, when we do the rest of the calculation, this chip is going to be active. These ones are off, so they're not doing anything. And at the end of the next cycle, the switch, for example, might have modified the memory, or memory might have changed somehow because of some other thing. And now the second time, hup, it's going to do a second, it's going to activate the second chip. So maybe this a answers your question about how to split up. Does it? I'm not sure. Mm, it depends how you use it, because uh, here, to change from uh, the first chip to the second chip, you still need to run a loop. Yes, you still run a loop every and time. And my, my question was more like, uh, if you need to do multiple uh, iterative uh, operations in the same loop. So you have to play, the player mm -hmm. does something, like in this case, you have input, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then a, a modify the position of, of an entity, and then you take that modified position and uh, feed it to the AI, because they want to type collision. Right, so in that case, there's a few ways to do that. One way is to have a put more lo regroup more logic into the chip, have the chip be kind of big because it's doing lots of calculation. And another way to do it is to put. I'm not. I'm not going to talk about it here, but there's a way to kind of farm out a lot of this work to functions, and you basically have functions that do a bunch of stuff for you. And since uh, the arguments, since these are pure functions, a little bit like a functional programming language, um, you you know that given the same input, they always calculate the same output. And so you can reuse that. So once you calculate it once, you can just cache what those, put in cache what those values are, and the next time it's very fast to do it. So there's a way to, there's a way, there's another way to do it. Okay. Um, so, I'm, uh, so I don't know who's seen um, Brett, Brett Victor's videos of, uh, yes, a lot of people. That's great. It's really cool. It's really, really cool stuff that he's done. And, and we were really inspired by, especially that video, Inventing on Principle, which is one of the really well-known ones. Where he, he shows this great stuff. He shows this thing where he has kind of like a. Well, it's kind of. It looks like he was he was taking on stuff off of stuff off of off of braid. And so he has um, he has this little you know his little character that jumps on a turtle and hops over a big a big pit. And you know he says, okay, well now imagine that you know I decided that you know it didn't work out for my level. Like you know he jumped too high or he jumped too low, and I want to adjust that parameter, right? Rather than going back and saying, okay, now I'm going to change gravity recompile the game, play the game again, and try to do exactly the same thing. He just stops the game, puts it on pause. He changes the parameter, and he goes back in time, so gravity in this case, he goes back in time and he retraces what happened. And so he can just change, the, change this code 
and we see, well, what, what would have happened had my code been different in so the past? So. We have two full so No, sorry. The room is already over capacity. No, it was already too full before. Sorry. It's too full. Guys, please. There's a reason why the sign is up. So basically what he's doing is going back in time. So what, what his system's been doing is, is, is remembering what the user did at every point. And we can do the same thing. Because once again, we're basically freezing memory and freezing input and output in every cycle. So we know what, what keyboard keys were pressed at every cycle. We know which, where the mouse was, what the network was at that point, you know, everything. And so we can easily go back in time, change the code, and rerun what would have happened. Uh, we can also do cool things about muting chips, like you know, I talked about earlier, the switches can turn chips on and off, but we can do that manually too. We can say, well, just this, I want just this chip active. I want to see what, what happens if just this one's going on when you're debugging. So it's a lot like in the, in the electronics example, just you know, pulling out everything else temporarily, except of course you don't have to literally pull stuff out because it's a computer. Um, we can find chips. That's another thing that he shows in his video. He shows how he can, well, in his case, it's not a chip, it's a program directly, but he kind of mouses over the screen and, he sh and it shows him where in the code, what, what lines of code are drawing the thing that he's mousing over on the screen. And we can do the same thing and we can go the other direction. We can say, well, um, what, you know, for a given chip, like what is it drawing? What is it, what is it changing in memory? Um, all right. Are there any more questions? Afterwards, I'm going to move on to the technical challenges. So. Okay. All right. So, okay. So we're doing this in a browser. Okay. And we're letting users write their own code. So obviously there's a problem because, you know, it's all right if you write your own code for your own game, but if you're sharing your game to other people and you put some malicious code in there that's going to change the web page or do something or have them log into PayPal or whatever, it's a potential problem. So there's, um, for those of you who web, web developers might know like JS Fiddle and Plunker and sites like that that do, um, they already do this kind of thing where you kind of share code snippets across the web. And the way they do it is they have an iframe so, and that's within the page and they have it set to be a different domain. And when you do that in the, for web browsers, that kind of sets off the security models of web browsers. And they go, whoa, 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 hold on. If it's from a different domain, I'm not going to let them like access the cookies and access the web and the different kinds of, uh, access the network and these kind of things. And we, we use a similar thing. We're actually using a, a kind of a newer technology out of the HTML5 uh, spec that does this, that actually does sandboxing. And you can say, well, I want this iframe to run. I don't want it, to, I want it to be able to execute JavaScript, but I don't want it to be able to reach out of its page to access anything else. Um, is that's what we do. So we use this sandbox attribute, and then when that happens, well then, to, we can't call functions directly in that sandbox, so then we have to pass messages back and forth. So basically at every cycle, uh, when the game's running, uh, within this sandbox, it's sending out messages being like, well this is the memory, this is the, this is the input and output at that point. So it's kind of an asynchronous thing, but it, it works for what we're doing. Um, okay, and we also have this thing of patching. So I talked a little bit a little earlier how in the case that multiple chips are writing out to the same pins in memory or to input and output, we want to be able to kind of merge those things together. Okay? And we've taken an approach very similar to like the way the way that version control works. So if you know you're familiar with Git or whatever, yeah. when you when you you know it's a little bit like you're cloning or you're for, you're either forking or you're branching a repository and two people are working on it simultaneously and then you want to merge back together again. Right? So how does it do it? So typically it creates patches for each one. So the patches is, a, is basically just a diff. It's the difference between what the state, what the code was before and what the code is now, that you've changed it. And so it's gonna take whatever the common ancestor was, like the, the base of whatever your change was. It's gonna see well, what, what happened on, in each case. It's gonna calculate out those, those differences, those patches, and then merges them back together again. So that's what we do now. Um, but we run into basically a really um, naive, uh, Algorithm, which is what I, which is what I wrote, because I didn't know really what I was doing, um, fails pretty quickly once you get to large arrays and stuff. Because in arrays, it's hard to know if you are moving things around, if you moved an element from one place to another, or if you just changed it all together. Or if you remove a few, it doesn't really understand. So there's, we're, we're actually actually moving now to using these longer, longest common subsequence algorithms, which are a lot more sophisticated. Um, and another interesting algorithms that we could choose are operational transforms. So that's basically what's used in like Google Docs, for example. I think also in Etherpad and some of those other. And whenever you have like a document online that multiple people are changing at once, it's it's you doing this. It's like these mathematical operations that said like I changed this thing at this particular point in time, and then it can be they're able to merge together with math and figure out you know the both deleted characters that's not the same one or it is that kind of thing. 
Okay, we have this history problem too. So like I said, we want to be able to track the history at all points in the past, or at least up to a certain limit. Um, but in order to do that, right, we can't write over the memory then, so we have to clone it, we have to copy it, which takes up a lot of space if your memory is big. And so there are better approaches to that. So the one, the one that we're using now is, um, is we basically keep, uh, well, so one, one, one way to get around that is you just, you, which is similar to what Git does, I'm pretty sure. They kind of take a snapshot at some point, like the full version, and then after that, they just store patches at each point. So what changed, what changed, what changed, what changed. So if you want to figure out what happened here, well, then you go back to the last full copy. You apply all those patches in a row until you get to here. And then you know what the memory was. I mean, what the, um, yeah, what the memory was at that point. And of course, you have to once in a while store these full ones. Otherwise, when you're accessing ones at the end, well, then you have to start all the way at the beginning and calculate it all through. And that takes a long time. Um, and there's actually an even more interesting approach, which is what uh, the closure programming language that I mentioned earlier uses called persistent data structures. So I wanted to talk about it because I think they're really interesting. So um, imagine you have a vector or an, or an array, right, of four elements. So obviously the, 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 more no like the more normal way to store that would be, you know, have like four elements together in memory right next to each other. But if instead you store them as a list, so like a linked list structure where each, each element points to the next one, you can do some really interesting things. If you have a second list where I changed the first element, I, I made it into the number five. Well, what I can do then is just create just the head of the list, just the number five, and then have it point to the rest. So now it goes five, two, three, four. So what's interesting, one case, what's interesting about that is not only um, can I use this list without um, reusing, me the, without reallocating uh, memory that I've used for the rest of the elements, but in fact, the first one still exists. So I can use both list A and list B in parallel, and they don't run into any conflicts. And uh, so this, it's a little easy to see how it applies to lists, and what's actually more interesting is that it applies to a lot of other data structures as well. They've done it for uh, trees, for like hash maps, and a lot of other data structures that you may have used. And it's actually pretty fast, surprisingly, which you wouldn't necessarily think. Um, and it's a really nice way to get around um, cloning data over and over again. Okay. Um, I think this is my last technical challenge I was going to talk about is this thing of this buffering I.O. So like I was talking about earlier, as we kind of we treat I.O. like memory that we're writing to. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. It's a little bit of a, you have to kind of get your head around. You have to turn your head around a little bit to think about, think about things this way. Because usually, at least in, in the JavaScript world, everything is kind of event-based. Like if you want to find out when someone presses a keyboard key, well, you have a keyboard key down handler. You event, and you have to bind to the handler and to the event, and then you get the event. Oh, they put the keyboard down, okay? Or for similar for the mouse, the mouse moved. Okay, I got to do something about it. Um, and so what we do is simply transform those over just to just memory. So for example, is what's the position of the mouse? Well, rather than like you know binding to an event or calling out a mouse, a get 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 mouse position function, we just have that available already. Mouse dot position just gives you the position of the mouse. And similarly for the keyboard. It kind of keeps, tra we have the system keep track of which keyboard keys are down and it just gives it to you. Now, you know, we're not the only ones to do this. Uh, this is also the way it's done in some other game engines. Like I'm pretty sure Unity uses, works this kind of way too, at least for the mouse. Um, now for output, it's, it's a little, it's, it's a little more interesting. So for output we have, so typically this would be like in the Canvas API in, for, in JavaScript, for those who are familiar with it. You maybe if you want to draw a rectangle on the screen, well you have sort of a context and you change its style. <coughs> it's also the kind of a state machine and then you, decide, well, fill a rectangle with whatever the current style is. And so this makes a rectangle that starts at 0, 0 and goes to 100, 100. Right? So it's a 100 meter square, 100, 100, 100 pixel square. Um, and what we do instead is we just describe a shape object. So this, this in, in, for those who aren't familiar with JSON, this, is a, uh, this just describes an object, so a set of fields. And we say what the fill style is, the position, the size. We're not even renaming anything. We're not really creating our own API. We're just wrapping the current one that exists. And you just send that out to another list. So when the graphics, uh, when, when it comes, when the graphics are called at the end of the clock tick, um, it just goes through the array and draws them all. And you can actually, we can then separate them out into layers and say, well, only draw, you know, we can separate out and have some draw in different layers and even say, well, if a particular layer hasn't been changed, if it's the same, we don't have to redraw it. We can just keep it on screen, things like that. Um, and for HTML, it, we can do HTML too, so that's kind of cool, especially when you're working in a web browser. You don't want to have to rewrite like input controls and all that kind of stuff. 
uh, right, for text and stuff. The Canvas API can do it, but it's pretty ugly. And HTML does it really nice, and you have CSS already and everything, you know, you want. So uh, we use this fantastic library called Rivets.js, where it does this two-way data binding uh, that exists in like Angular JS, if you're familiar with that, it uses, does that kind of thing too. Where basically it, 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 it has all the elements and it keeps track of the fact that someone changed the data in a particular text field or checked, you know, checked off a checkbox. And it updates memory somewhere to do that or it tells you some kind of event. And we do a similar thing. So we have it, we basically use rivets in order to say, okay, well, here's, here's a template, a bunch of HTML I want you to draw on the screen. Here is the bunch of values that I want you to use. So it's going to fill in the text boxes and check off the radio buttons and whatever. And then it, it alerts us whenever something's changed. And so then we can update it on the next cycle. Um, and for HTTP, um, so for networking stuff, we basically, we just have to get rid of, you know, normally again in JavaScript you do this thing where you send off a request and then you get called back through a callback function asynchronously when that thing is, when the request has completed or failed, whatever happened. And we do basically, again, replace that with data. So we have a data object that describes the request you want to make and when you get a response, well, we fill in the response for you. Right. Okay, so not much more to say, um, except that we're really interested in having some feedback and some help with the project. Um, there's not a lot of us working on it and we're really excited to have a lot of games. We have a, we have a new version coming out uh, in just like a week or two. Um, and I'd be really excited if people want to put their games on it or give me feedback on their games or remix games that are on there. Um, we're also going to be running, like, uh, for those of you who aren't that far from Paris, we're going to be running um, a, uh, a game jam based on remixing games. Where basically we're going to take a whole lot of, we're going to like program a bunch of really basic games like you know, Arkanoid and like Tetris, the kind of thing, kind of clones of those, Pac-Man. And then we're going to ha just have people during the game jam, they're just going to take Take those, those classic games and kind of remix them in crazy ways. So if anyone's interested, I'd be really happy to have you, uh, have you come. Um, and also, of course, if you want to work on the project itself, it's open source and it's online, we're really happy uh, for your help. One last thing I wanted to mention um, is about this, it's, it's this, so we're running this game club in Paris also called, uh, called the, called the Gamedier. So we have a bunch of invited speakers coming from a lot from the indie game community who come and speak. Uh, and we also run these micro game jams, which are basically, it's like a game jam, but within three hours. And so the idea is you have, is obviously you're not going to you know, program a thing. It's more like kind of a, you kind of come up with like a new board game idea or card games, or at least just test the concept with like a paper prototype. And we try to film everything. So we have all, all these, basically all the interviews are available <coughs> on the website, um, as well as some of the results from the game jams. And that's about, oops, sorry. Wanted to show at the very end, so it's going to take a while. <laughs> Come on. At the very end, I had all the information about how to contact me. If you're, all right, sorry. All right. So, right, there's the website and Twitter and my own contact information if you're interested. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, I would like to know in what language is this implemented in? I so guess it's ja JavaScript? Or? Yeah, it's ja well, the games are in JavaScript and most of the, the mm -hmm. engine is in CoffeeScript. Yeah, because uh, you talked about Clojure quite a, quite a long yeah. time, so why, why not use ClojureScript? Why not? Because I didn't know ClojureScript when I started it. Yeah, you, you <laughs> I should, probably, it's, it's, really, it's a nice language. It, sounds, it's like, it looks really fantastic. And I, tell, I think I would have written it in ClojureScript. Yeah, because, because lo lots of uh, things you talked about uh, also is in like moving state and everything. Uh, they have quite a, quite a lot of nice stuff, for example, co core sync, that's mm -hmm. sort of a, a synchronous uh, code uh, in, in JavaScript, so you can have uh -huh. events like um, uh, FBP or, or, or um, uh, react reactive programming. Oh, so you, okay. you can have events and uh, they they get streamed uh, inside your code without having callbacks or anything like that. Like oh, yeah. It's similar to, co to Go uh, routines in, in Go. Mm -hmm. We have uh, it's all asynchronous, and also there there are uh, propagators, which I don't know if you if you're aware. They are like cells, uh, and uh, you have data inside cells, and they they are connected with the with the methods or or uh, functions, and uh, you you can you, you can stream data, so it's really, really similar to what you're oh, doing. Yeah. So you, you, you could yeah, I probably it. ended up rewriting a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, already. It's always nice to rewrite. Right, yeah. But you're right though. You're right. I should definitely check it out. Yes. Um, a lot of game logic 
is often um, you know trigger based, mm -hmm. uh, where instead of, instead of observing data, we sort of want to know when it changes. Uh, is it something that ends up being more in within the chips, or that you handle with like switches and like externally in, within the graph? Yeah. So event like triggers are really tricky because. There's this, always this problem around like the first time you use something right. that uses a trigger. Like there's always this thing of like, okay, I'm gonna listen to this event, listen to the trigger, but hold on, maybe I need to do it right now as well, right? So that's why at first we didn't really include them directly. Like it kind of the idea you kind of just track the something continuously, and when you need to do something, just do it. Like you kind of check the condition at the beginning of the chip. But we definitely something that we thought about adding is something that directly gives you what's what's changed since the last cycle, um, which I think would be helpful for some things. I mean, if you want to have a character jump from platform or like handle collisions at some point or stuff that are instantaneous. So like yeah, you're right. But show up I guess the, uh, the way you end up handling it is you just write out a variable. I mean, in the end, you end up like, for example, jumping. Like you don't want the, you want them to jump just once, for example, and not you know jump twice because you still have the space button, space uh, button down, for example. Well, you would you would basically you, you keep track in memory whether or not you are already jumping, which seems a little redundant at some point. Like you don't have the trigger thing. But at the same time, what it allows you to do is go back in time, change the code, and have it replay exactly what would have happened anyway. Whereas triggers are harder to kind of sequence that way. So, like, so, so this sort of logic goes inside the chips, or you express this in the graph? In the graph. In the graph. Basically, the game engine handles like passing the data and going back and forth and keeping track of what, of what the state of the game is at a particular point. And in, in that way, the chips actually are just calculating out values each time. And so you can rerun them over and over again. And they're not going to change the state of the game in any way, which makes it nice to test it, you know. Um, okay. Yes? Have you already tried to write Tetris or something in the uh, Yeah, we've written, we've written um, I don't know if you remember, there's, there's two games. Well, at the very beginning of the talk, I have a bunch of games that we've been working on. And two of them were actually written on this platform. An older version that isn't as sophisticated as one we have now. Um, yeah, so I definitely know it works. We haven't actually written out Tetris yet, but I'm really excited to do that. I think that's going to be <laughs> particularly fun. But yeah, I, I, I cannot even imagine how it would look like when you merge two games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it has a different structure to it. I mean, um, uh, yeah, I don't have a full example here. It'll be interesting to show you an example. But if you're interested, get in touch with me and we'll try to, uh, I'll, I'll keep you updated. And I can send you some examples of full games when we have them. Uh, you can check it out. You can see. Yep. Do you, do, do you have a visual graph? So the problem with visual graphs is that, like, they're really complicated when they get big. You know, they're kind of easy when they get small. So the, the way, the way we, we have it is we have basically, like, just a tree structure. We don't actually show the graph. And then for a particular node, you can click on a node and see where those things are connected. But we're thinking about later on actually making a visual graph. It would be really pretty. It's just it's always challenging how you fit that onto a screen, you know? Like it's really, like, like it's hard to like pan horizontally, it's really hard and, and to, you know, um, and it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, if you zoom out too far, you can't see anything. And if you zoom in, you can't see all the other parts. So there are, our, our, our idea is more to kind of focus on one chip at a time. And then, um, but it'd be, for example, things that we can do fairly easily Imagine you click on a chip, right? Well, then we know what, what that chip is connected to, both for input and for output. And then we can then, so then if you click on one of the other things, that it's, we can show all those connections. And if you click on one of its connections, well, then you can see where that thing is connected to. So it would allow you to like kind of trace, like, you know, well, what else is modifying this memory? Like, what else is, you know, doing output here? You know, that kind of thing. Oh, really? You're going to work? Can you say it again, sir? Oh, you've been working with them? Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> is, is it good? Is it? Yeah, it was good. Yeah? Cool. Any other questions? Uh, yeah? So you mentioned that you can call out to pure functions, and I was wondering oh, how do you ensure that they're pure? Do you have like a special language, or do you just control the API that they can access? Well, right now, we basically clone the data so that they can't do anything wrong. Right. <laughs> but there's, there's probably a better way to do it. I think, also, like we're thinking about doing, for example, something that really lacks in JavaScript are like vector operations. So you can't just add vectors together or multiply them or anything like that. And so we're thinking about using, there's these really excellent uh, JavaScript parsers that run also in JavaScript. And so you can kind of basically decompile the language, change things around, and then send it up again. So we could use that kind of approach, for example, to check that they're not writing out to build memory, or check that they're not modifing something in memory. We could use that kind of approach. I think that would probably be better. 
I'm plugging it in each time. There's like, I think Douglas Crawford's uh, AdSafe library uses that. He wrote this JavaScript library back a while ago to make sure that ads aren't messing with your JavaScript. And he uses that kind of approach. It's basically like a, a sub-language of JavaScript. But it has its own limitations, of course. It's not running at full speed. So. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks a lot. <laughs>